Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you happen to stand into this incredible dialogue with folks that I am, I don't have any idea why I'm so fortunate to know these folks, but I am because of our work in the con at www.thecon.tv. Um, but the mission continues to try to bring information forward to the public and also to people that need to hear this information from insiders that have been around the block a few times and have, um, insight uh, in a way that few do. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna introduce this powerhouse team of folks that we've assembled here today. And uh, starting down from my, from what I'm saying, down at the bottom of the screen, we see uh, Ms. June Carbone, who is the uh, distinguished Rabina Chair in Law, Science and Technology at the University of Minnesota. She is an expert in family law, assisted reproduction, property and law, medicine and bioethics, and also has taught contracts, remedies, financial institutions, civil procedure, and feminist jurisprudence. Professor Carbone received her JD from Yale Law School in 1978 and her AB magna cum laude from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Affair, Public and International Affairs at Princeton in 1975. Her latest book is Fair Shake, Women and the Fight to Build a Fair Economy. And also I would like to mention for this conversation, she also wrote a book called Red Families Versus Blue Families, legal polarization, uh, and the creation of culture, which is obviously uh, very relevant to everything that we're all in the midst of. Um, and uh, next uh, to my left is Paul Pelletier. And uh, Paul is the um, an experienced white collar trial attorney and consultant with demonstrated history of leading and conducting high level white collar investigations and internal reviews in both the public and private sector. Paul has led over 100 federal jury trials, including 25 financial fraud matters to juries at the Department of Justice. Paul investigated and prosecuted executives at Quest Communications, General Reinsurance, and AIG. He investigated and prosecuted international Ponzi schemer Alan Stanford and oversaw DOJ's enforcement efforts at corporate fraud, healthcare fraud, and violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. For more than 25 years, Paul was the senior most financial fraud prosecutor at the Department of Justice. And um, he is also now, um, well, in private practice, conducts high stakes international investigations and compliance reviews for publicly traded corporations and serves as adjunct law professor at George Washington University. And uh, just below Paul on my screen is Mark Dan, Attorney Mike Mark Dan has devoted his entire career to fighting for consumers and small businesses, beginning with his tenure as an antitrust director in the office of West Virginia, Virginia's Attorney General and continuing today at Dan Law, a consumer protection law firm that he founded and manages and operates in Cleveland and Columbus, Cincinnati, New Jersey and New York. He is a national leader in utilizing provisions of the Real Estate Settlement Act, RESPA, and the Truth in Lending Act, TILA, to bring legal claims against and secure monetary damages from banks and mortgage loan servicers that abuse, cheat, and defraud borrowers. In addition to his work as an attorney, Dan served the people of Ohio as member of the Ohio Senate, where he introduced numerous consumer protection bills, including comprehensive predatory lending law that was rated among the best in the United States. And he has successfully led efforts to strengthen the statute of limitations for victims of child sexual abuse and expand the rights of crime victims and extend the reach of the Ohio Consumer Sales Practice Act and the Federal Telephone Solicitation Act. He was elected attorney general in 2006. And then last but not least is Bill Black, an associate professor, retired, but um, a, a man who needs no introduction, but he is the foremost white collar criminologist. He was an executive director at the Institute for Fraud Prevention, um, and he taught LBJ, at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and at Santa Clara, where he was also the Distinguished Scholar in Residence for Insurance Law um, and Visiting Scholar at the Markula, Markula Center for Applied Ethics. He was the lit Litigation Director of the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, Deputy Director of FISLIC, Senior Vice President of the General Counsel of the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, and Senior Director, Chief of Counsel, Office of Thrift Supervision. So, um, quite a bit of a, a, a runway and ramp up, but I want to start the question with you, Miss um, Carbone. Considering what we're looking down, um, what's got a lot of people anxious and, um, uh, quite frankly, worried about this 
incoming election and all things that have uh, preceded it. Can you give us your kind of opening thoughts and your, your reflections about what we're looking at? Sure. Well, um, I, don't, I mean, aside from the fact nobody knows how this election is going to come out, uh, on a long-term basis, one of the things that I've been looking at is uh, one-party states. And what you see is right out of the playbook from the end of Reconstruction. Uh, voter suppression in a number of states, erasing people from the polls, and the Supreme Court saying with respect to overt efforts to gerrymander, to rig the vote uh, in ways that look legal, go ahead. Uh, we are no longer going to supervise voter suppression, even when directed at black voters. Initially, they said because, hey, this isn't racial discrimination. This is because they're Democrats. That's OK. And so what you have is a system where the federal courts, which used to oversee the more egregious uh, parts of voter suppression with a racial impact, no longer, uh, not only are unwilling to intervene, they've defanged the Justice Department where it's willing to intervene. Uh, for those of us who have been paying attention for some time, that's both shocking and almost unbelievable. But yet at the same time, as you've just explored, uh, something that's already happened during Reconstruction. So when Kamala, Kamala Harris and the campaign says we're not going back, this seems to be one of those issues that they should be addressing publicly. But I'm not hearing enough of. Uh, but I know a lot of people are curious about. Bill, can you give us some of your sort of overview thoughts of what we're looking at um, considering the election and what people don't understand? Sure. Um, the uh, other critical thing on my resume is spouse of June Carbone, uh, by the way, for uh, folks. And uh, we lived uh, for 20 years in Silicon Valley. And uh, most people have probably not read, but virtually all the top people in Silicon Valley have read uh, a whole series of manifestos. And uh, the patron saint of these is one of the sons of Milton Friedman. His name is David Friedman. But these manifestos basically um, end up wanting a libertarian paradise for the uh, ultra wealthy. And so they're extremely hostile to any rule of law. And in particular, any rule of law or taxation uh, that has substantial effect on highly wealthy folks. And these manifestos are very explicitly against any laws uh, on discrimination uh, and laws that uh, make it uh, easier to prosecute uh, elite white collar folks and even laws that make it uh, possible to uh, prosecute corrupt politicians. They want a corrupt world in which they pull the strings, right? And these folks like Peter Thiel and such have been openly anti-democratic. I don't mean democratic party. I mean, democracy. right? <laughs> uh, and openly anti-women and openly a whole host of other types of things. Um, and they are part of the group, just part. Uh, that have been the major patrons to the Federalist Society and the Federalist Society effort to uh, stack not just the Supreme Court, but obviously famously the Supreme Court, with uh, justice, judges and justices who have among their absolute top priorities eviscerating laws that allow us to prosecute, regulate elite white collar criminals and their elite uh, political patrons. 
Well, it's a remarkable opening statement, and I think nails it. You know, from a layman's perspective, I might call that, well, geez, it sounds a little bit like corporate fascism and or tyranny, which, surprise, is just the antithesis of what our country is supposed to be. Paul, look, you've been on the front lines, I mean, it, it, forever and ever, fighting this fight, and everybody on this call has. But you're in a unique position having been the lead white-collar investigator, uh, prosecutor at the Department of Justice, <laughs> from what I'm looking at, that sounds like a crisis to me, Paul. What are your thoughts going into this election in the final lap? Yeah, well, look, thank, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, very clear from what we just heard from June and, and Bill that this election puts us on the precipice of something potentially very bad. I think that, you know, my expertise is clearly criminal law and white collar crime. But I think if you ask any American or most Americans, they'd say they want an effective and efficient criminal justice system. In order to have that, you need an effective and functioning judiciary. You need an effective and functioning Department of Justice. You need an effective and functioning regulatory scheme. And um, I think if we look at what the Heritage Foundation, what Trump has, has talked about routinely is a complete eradication of all of that, an eradication of all of that, and and I and I, I really mean that sincerely. So it's it's hard to imagine, it's hard to understand why most Americans who really want a functioning criminal justice system and depend upon it would choose a candidate who has talked about taking and wiping it out completely. He wants to um, take away all of or most of the public servants that currently serve in the U.S. government, you know, the Department of Justice. He wants to weaponize the Department of Justice against people um, that aren't of his ilk. And and it, it's very clear, as what Bill said, that, you know, the, the, the elite in this in this country who have always been treated with kid gloves criminally um, will get a special pass. Um, we've seen some of that in, in, in the pardons that that Trump issued when he was president. So it, it, it is um, it is amazing to me, as I sit here and look at what's going on, that Americans, the majority of Americans would actually choose that type of government. I don't think they will, I pray that they won't, but I do think we're on the precipice of that. And if, if, um, if the voters are not allowed to vote and uh, the majority of people aren't allowed to 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 cast their ballots and and for a candidate who I believe the majority of people will vote for and that's Kamala Harris I think that we're in for a world of hurt and I, I don't even want to think about what that would look like. Well, thank you for that, Paul. And uh, it's it's look it's befuddling to just anybody who ever believed that nobody was above the law in the United States. But what you're hearing here right away is something slightly different than that, especially handling, handling elites uh, with kid gloves. But Mark, I mean, we know that Donald Trump <clears throat> is not an elite. He's a befuddling buffoon at, at the very best. But when Paul references the Heritage Foundation, we're talking about think tanks. We're talking about big money. We're talking about decades of planning to basically manifest this what I'm going to call a hijacking of our democracy uh, to create oligarchical corporate forces that are above the law that can't be held to account based on the expertise of what Bill Black has demonstrated for his entire career. But yet you as well, had we not discovered you, Mark, as attorney general of, of Ohio, who ferreted out a regional you know, uh, racketeering enterprise that was representative of the entire financial system, you know, we wouldn't have known what... <laughs> Actually, the government should have done. Now, we're talking about the Department of Justice with its giant resources that have been hedged by something that's even more influential. Mark, what are your opening thoughts given, I don't know, gosh, the last 15 years of your career, man? Well, so a couple of things. Um, one is, June, I want to in response to what June was saying, uh, which I thought was, was was spot on. You know, I live here in, in red Ohio or reddish, redder. And I like to think it's purple, but it's really not anymore. Um, this morning, in my in my in my when I was at the gym, my buddy uh, uh, told me how he had to physically carry his disabled wife from the car to the drop box to place her absentee ballot to, to avoid committing a felony by hand by by delivering her ballot to the to the box himself from the car. 
Um, that's where we are in terms of voter suppression. Uh, yesterday here in, in, in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, stunning to me um, as, as we think about it, um, but, but, but truly, uh, truly a, a, a very, very scary uh, moment in, in time for, for small D democracy in, in, this, in, in, in this country. Um, so, you know, where we go from that, and, and, and again, it, all pl it plays into all the things everybody's been talking about, including the, uh, including the politicization of the federal judiciary. Um, uh, who you know who who refused to continue an injunction against that statute um, while the case was being while the constitutionality of that uh, clearly unconstitutional uh, statute was being considered um, and and you've got a very dangerous uh, brew um, but uh, as the only recovering politician on this panel I want to I want to I want to um, you know I think that Democrats have their their share of 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 the blame for where we are here too. So what's interesting is Trump's theory of the case or the theory of the case that at least as as, as my working class friends uh, interpret it is, is that, that the Democrats have been doing this all along um, and, uh, and, the, and the more moderate Republicans, uh, who, you know, the ones that, are, that, are, that aren't endorsing Trump um, in, in the Bush administration and the uh, in administrations and the, uh, and in 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 Obama and Clinton, um, they've been they've just kept it secret. Um, they they've just not indicted people. They've just not done their work. They've not finished the job. Um, uh, you know, we in Ohio, we, we most recently had this first energy government corruption scandal where they where the, where the you know the state's largest utility uh, bribed um, uh, openly bribed the Speaker of the House, who's been convicted of of that. Um, and several others, uh, I think five or six people have now been convicted for receiving and and and, and acting in response to those bribes. But the bribe wars, uh, the the U.S. Justice Department passed them over and chose not to prosecute them. Now, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, m mainly because it was to his political advantage, uh, the current state attorney general, Dave, David Jost, um, uh, forcing me to actually say something nice about him. Um, act, uh, actually uh, uh, initiated a state level prosecution of those uh, of those executives. Um, but his ability to 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 complete that case, the resources that exist in Summit County, Ohio, uh, and in the in, in in the Ohio Attorney's General's Attorney's General Attorney General's Office, you know, make it, uh, up against the largest um, you know white collar defense law lawyers in the country, make, makes me worry that 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 case may not go the way. Uh, that he hopes, although it seems very obvious to me. So, so I think that what, what Trump is saying, his theory of the case is, well, yeah, they've been doing this and they've been pretending that they're for you. I'm going to do it um, and I'm going to tell you I'm going to do it and here's how I'm going to do it and here's Elon Musk who's going to help me do it. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and, it's, and you know what? We know better and we'll make your life better. Um, and so don't worry. Uh, don't worry about that man behind the curtain um, this is, you know, we're, we're going to embrace this in a way that's going to, that's, that, that there be, we're not, nothing's going to change really, except that, except that we're going to be open and honest about it. Um, and we're going to, and I'm going to use that to, you know, to give you what you want, which is of course his other theory of the election, which is to just anybody, anybody, anything he thinks will get him a vote, he will say he will do, um, whether he'll do it or not. And at the end of the day, um, I got to believe the folks at the at at, at, at BlackRock and and on Wall Street and at the hedge funds in this country are are celebrating. They can't lose this election because because Kamala Harris, I think she has a chance because you know I did know her as Attorney General and she did did take some stands, but she she came up short from time to time, um, like with the um, uh, financial crisis and and like with bank you know with her settlements with the with the big banks. It, they were great financial settlements. But she didn't go all the way, um, and 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 the and the attorney general's office in California actually has prosecutorial powers and resources to to, to take those kind of things on. She didn't do what we did. Um, she 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 could have and had the opportunity to, but she stopped short. That doesn't mean she didn't do anything. And I think she may be better and more attuned to 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 the rule of law uh, and 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 criminal justice uh, needs be, as her with her background as an AG and a prosecutor. But but she's cut from that same that same whole cloth, unfortunately. Um, and and so at the end of the day, certainly I'm going to vote for her, and I'm I'm in, I'm knocking on doors for her, and 
uh, and, 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 and encouraging my friends to. Uh, but, but, I, but I, you know, I think that we've made this real easy for them. And, and, and that's really tragic and, and disappointing. Um, and, and of course, we can't fix that without a time machine. But, but you know, I don't see a future in the Democratic Party even now where, where we're likely to nominate people in the future that are willing to, uh, to, 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 you know, to push those envelopes to actually, to actually embrace the rule of law in the way that I think uh, that, uh, that most Americans think it ought to be embraced. I, I got to ask you a quick follow up, but I'm going to set this up. And it, it, look, it it just you hit so many incredibly important parts, and it dovetails into what your experience was, Mark. First and foremost, you mentioned Kamala by way of what took place after the Great Financial Crisis, and those who've paid attention understand the story of Steve Mnuchin, which had absolutely horrific consequences, right? But what you did was you did what has. I think become the precedent for what we just saw with first energy. I remember reading articles recently mm -hmm. that they got the idea from your work when you took mm -hmm. on Dave Willen and everything that took place. So you had mm -hmm. showcased, look, here's the resources. You put the investigation together and I have to dovetail this into what the larger audience can understand because it's been in front of our face because it's been so salacious over the course of the last six months and maybe three years, we've seen P Diddy, get nailed for stuff that's been going on for 20 plus years. And finally, we see him taken down for racketeering, right? 20 years later, this has been a long, 20 years of what these guys were up to. Weinstein, Weinstein had been involved with this type of stuff for years and years before the DA took, to, uh, you know, took action. Uh, you know, obviously, salaciously, whatever you want to think about Epstein and however that worked out, but weirdly under, uh, you know, uh, Attorney General William Barr during the Trump administration, a different scenario. But the bottom line is that, look, these are salacious, gross, uh, the worst of humanity sort of expressions. But what you guys are dealing with are the real power, the real money, those who control everything around us. And so, Mark, again, just to emphasize what we have to send a message, a collective message, I think, to Tim Walsh specifically, because Tim Walsh wasn't created or incubated in an Ivy League wall. Uh, you know, no no offense to those who came from Ivy League, but in an Ivy League education that goes into a hedge fund or a private equity fund to be one of these guys like J.D. Vance in your own state. What do we, based on your experience, have to have for a government of by and for the people with the law that actually leans into the threat of this financial disaster that we're in the midst of in terms of who runs the country? Well, I, I think we need to, we need to lean in. I mean, we need to learn something from Trump and, and, and actually uh, develop a theory of the case that, that highlights why this is an important thing that we do and take the risk that we're going to offend some people along the way. Um, uh, and that, uh, and that, and that's hard. Um, uh, you know, there's still so much emphasis on money. Um, I, I thought on Saturday Night Live Saturday it was it was great when when uh, Colin Jost reported that uh, that she's raised a billion dollars and you know maybe she'll stop texting him for money. Um, you know the fact that they're you know they have literally full communication money and they're still out raising money is just mind boggling to me. Um, uh, it, it is just it, how much is too much and and, and you know it's not like there's not going to be full communication. In this election, it's not like the, the, that we that, that we don't have a probably a two to one advantage in resources going into the general election on the Democratic side. Um, yet, yet there's just this compulsion to continue to make book with corporate America um, in order to in order to in order to finance those campaigns. And 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 you know and and again you know there's 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 the super oligarchs and then there's the there's the you know the, the public company oligarchs. Um, that that are that are you know that are playing in much more in the democratic fold um, at the, at this point in time and and uh, uh, and, and I you know I it, and I understand having lived in Youngstown Ohio for for most of my adult life um, uh, and and having you know and being and, and, and using the members of my darts team as as my as my ongoing focus group I mean they are just angrier and angrier and angrier because they know. That if they get arrested, or if they cheat on their taxes, or if uh, if they if they form a company that, that defrauds other people, they're going to jail. And it's clear to them these other folks are not. Um, and and it's and it's and it's it's driven them to this idea. Well, you know, 
democracy isn't maybe not always cracked up to be because it's not providing, uh, you know, democratic application of, of, of the rule of law in this country. Um, and I think that and I think we need to address that and, 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 uh, and more directly um, and, and instead of just trying to, to be, you know, to be like them. Uh, Ms. Carbone, um, along those lines, I mean, you've been in the trenches advocating and fighting for people that are vulnerable your entire career at the highest levels. And when I think about the Supreme Court right now, particularly in light of the jobs decision and so forth, um, what is the what is your threat assessment and then your your resolution? I mean, this is an ongoing sort of theme of the dialogue, but given, like I said, in preface, your two recent books, you know, Fair Shake, uh, Creating Women and Creating a Fair Economy or a Fairer Economy. And then, of course, uh, you know, your expertise in, you know, families and the division between polarization. And uh, so you're as prescient a person that can comment on all of these scenarios, but specifically, can you maybe start by deconstructing your sort of assessment of the Supreme Court right now, given everything that's going on? Ooh, take a deep breath. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Chief Justice Roberts came and spoke uh, at my university a number of years ago, before the Supreme Court was as bad as it is today. And his defense was that no one on the court was a partisan in the sense of voting for Republicans because of Republicans. But they had ideological differences. Um, and, you know, um, that they were conservatives. Uh, and that's entirely legitimate, and consistent with, you know, the history of presidents appointing justices who share their political philosophy. But what he didn't say uh, was that when you look at the justices who have been appointed starting in the 70s uh, and accelerating over time, Chief Justice Roberts has wanted to repeal the New Deal. And I think it's important to understand what this means. It means first, bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is the rule of law. They want to free uh, the great individuals, the Elon Musks, uh, from the need to comply with bureaucratic directives. But what are bureaucratic directives? Basically, you shouldn't lie, cheat your employees, deceive your customers. Uh, and that when you're talking about people with a whole lot of money, you can hire great attorneys. This becomes so complex that when you present this to a jury in Elon Musk's most recent securities case, the jury uh, did not hold him liable. So they're massively complex cases because people with a lot of money are a master of disguising what they're doing. And juries don't get that lying. Now, lying about a porn star, they kind of get. Uh, fudging numbers. Um, when you're talking in public about things likely to boost your share price, they have a harder time getting their heads around. So you've got a problem with that. But the other piece is the federalism revolution. And I want to flag that too. Where it is the corporate lobbyists have the most power is in red states where there's no chance <laughs> that uh, the legislature is going to go the other way. Minnesota is one of the last states left in the country that has had a legislature divided by, uh, you know, one house is Democratic, the other is Republican. And the reason Walls looks like such a great progressive is when Democrats finally, for the first time in years, had both houses of the legislature, they got through their wish list, uh, which is mostly common sense things like free school lunches. But when you look at all that, what it means is it doesn't take a whole lot of money to primary a state rep who's a Republican, who isn't with the fat cat lobbying agenda. I did a paper where we looked at uh, post Dobbs, post the overturning of Roe versus Wade and restrictions on abortion. How friendly are states to children? And the answer, the, the most anti-abortion states also tend to be the most hostile to children. And it's fat cat corporate lobbyists who block 
things like raising the minimum wage, um, having Atlanta have a different minimum wage from the rest of the state, um, Medicaid expansion that would provide health care to people who fall through the cracks between uh, the exchanges and Medicaid. Those states are doing it in part because the legislature is entirely within the control of corporate lobbyists. So they're certainly not going to crack down on corruption. Well, which brings us to you that because the, the United the people of the United States have yet to, and this has been the biggest challenge to me and everything that I've been trying to uh, break through, they don't get it. <laughs> they're just we, we always have this sort of guffaw. We have this 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 sort of backpedal where it's like the American citizen. Here's 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 the uh, contradiction. Everybody's too busy to pay attention to be able to hold their government to account, right? I always use the analogy that. You don't need to know how to build an airplane or to fly an airplane or to understand the systems of air traffic control to be able to expect to buy a ticket and get from point A to point B safely. That's the entire infrastructure of the system, but it's got to work the way it's designed. Now, here I am with the experts from inside the system that are telling us that this system has been unfortunately perverted. And I've learned from the best there is, and that's William K. Black. And what I try to assess to anybody who I can get to listen, is when we're looking at the entirety of the American experiment, the entirety of the American dream, the entirety of all things, what this system is supposed to be, you can't compositely have a fair society. You can't have dynamism. You can't have, uh, you know, people find a need, fill a need, see a need, you know, without the structure of honesty in the system. And when it becomes perverse, it becomes this disaster of dark money, the shadow lenders, the shadow this or that, the shadow everything that seems to have a complete control. And so what was your first, um, you know, uh, sort of warning that something could be a foul? Yeah, the shadow, right? So, Bill, look, let's just think that you have the, let's just say Tim Walsh and Kamala decide to call you and say, Bill, look, we want to we want to clean this up. We want to put you in charge of this whole situation. What are you going to do? You're on mute, Bill. So first, going back to about 2008, 2009, the great financial crisis, Tom Frank, the great uh, uh, historian writer, um, asked me when the Obama administration was going to appoint me <laughs> to assist in the crackdown on uh, the uh, fraud, the elite fraudsters that drove the great financial crisis. And five minutes later, when I could stop laughing, I had to explain to him that everyone in America would have to die before <laughs> the Obama administration would appoint me to a position of power. <laughs> uh, uh, that, that wasn't gonna happen. Um, and so as Mark said, under Republicans and under Democrats, uh, you got terrible decisions at the federal level, not for four years after the great financial crisis, but for 15 years before the great financial crisis and eight years after the great financial crisis. Even though we had, it's exactly the fraud scheme that we had, our examiners had first identified in 1990 and that we had driven entirely out of the savings and loan industry by 1994. So we didn't have to reinvent anything. We knew how the fraud scheme, how the pr plus predation worked we knew the people doing it because they left for the shadow financial sector, which, by the way, economists thought was great. They said the problem was deposit federal deposit insurance, but the shadow will have all the right incentives, so we don't have to worry about it and such. And as Mark said, the Obama administration and some state AGs missed 
a fabulous opportunity. Now, you can't blame the state AGs very much at all relative to their federal counterparts because clearly the federal efforts to preempt the state AGs and, and keep them from succeeding were by far the worst governmental response to the growing great financial crisis. Now, that was done, as it happens, um, largely under Republican administrations, but the Clinton administration was all in on that type of stuff uh, as well. Both June and I, by the way, were also Justice Department attorneys, right? Uh, trial attorneys uh, in what's called the Federal Programs Branch of the Civil Division where you defend the constitutionality and statutory authority of government programs and statutes. So what all of us talking to you today can tell you from personal experience, right, is what an unparalleled asset, despite all the weaknesses, and boy, we can tell you the weaknesses in, in amazing detail, what an unparalleled asset American law and prosecutions and regulation have provided compared to the rest of the world. The United Kingdom created a serious fraud office just to deal with the types of things we deal with where we got over 1,700 successful prosecutions, we being the Department of Justice in, in that context, obviously. The Serious Fraud Office has virtually no successful prosecutions. It is read, uh, mocked on a regular basis by everybody in the United Kingdom. They, they had a U.S. jurist, retired jurist, and she had been a, a senior prosecutor, review their work. And her conclusion, and I quote, was that they had de facto decriminalized elite fraud in the United Kingdom. We, just in the savings and loan and bank debacle, sent 5,000 elite bankers and their you know, counterparts uh, in real estate to prison, right? The United Kingdom could run for the rest of its existence and it will not come close. And on top of that, there wasn't, there are many problems in the Justice Department, but there was an ethos in the Justice Department and in our regulatory group, for example, where one of the things in this panel is we don't just criticize Republicans. <laughs> you should see what we say about the, the Democrats who came across it. Of the prominent politicians, for example, that I blew the whistle on, five of the six were Democrats. And I was part of a group that we, you know, my counterparts and I worked in the federal agency for over a decade. To this date, 30 plus years later, I don't know what political party, if any, they are. We literally would never discuss anything like that. In the federal programs branch, if they had ordered us to go after a corporation on political grounds, there were at the time roughly 120 federal programs attorney, 100 of those attorneys and every single person in leadership would have resigned publicly to prevent that. There are very few countries in the world that have these kind, these two aspects. And we have been screwing it up. This immense gain that is so critical to the rule of law, to protecting people from these kinds of frauds and predation and having an effective economy. Because allowing these fraudsters produced, the, the economic estimate is 41.7 trillion, with a T, 
A trillion is a thousand billion dollars in lost GDP. All right. It is a staggeringly important asset that helps explain why the U.S. recovery compared to the rest of the world from the great financial crisis, from COVID, has, is the envy of the world. And we are the engine pulling the global economy out of these recessions and in fighting inflation. So this, this wonderful asset, what have we done? Well, okay, in response to the terrorist attacks, right? We transformed the SEC into an anti-terrorist organization. <clears throat> Perfectly understandable. But we could have replaced them, folks, they took out of elite, dealing with elite white collar crime. And we didn't. So effectively, we reduced the FBI's capacity <clears throat> by probably somewhere in the order of 60 to 75 percent. Because they took the best folks who were and most adept at following the money. <laughs> As Mark said, we had the federal government under the Bush administration in particular, but not just the Bush administration, second Bush administration, as the leading entity trying to prevent the state AGs from succeeding and making sure that the federal folks were actually assisting in this developing fraud epidemic that produced the great financial crisis. <clears throat> and afterwards, even though we had established all this expertise, both in the savings and loan and banking crisis and in the Enron era crisis, where Paul in particular uh, had such enormous success, it's invaluable to have people who know how to do this, who are really good at it. And you can see, uh, go back and look at our prior videos where Paul and I explained the key role of training at the federal level in particular, but not unique to the federal level. All of that was thrown away. The guy put in charge, the senior federal prosecutor under Obama, put in charge of training, said it made no sense to him that there could be looting because why would they lose money when the, there's looting? So why would they loot themselves? You know, this is moronic even as a matter of grammar. <laughs> it's the CEO looting. <coughs> the bank loses the money. It's real simple. And I, you know, we pointed this out. That guy, you can get point failures like that. He was literally in charge of the federal training effort in response to the great financial crisis. So here's a shock. They prosecuted no one elite in the banking ranks with the exception of a guy that, uh, or a series of people that ripped off a federally assisted merger, which brought them into the, the bailiwick of a, a, a different kind of federal official who blew the whistle. And, you know, he was therefore called on the carpet by the Secretary of Treasury of the United States of America personally, and screamed at and sworn at because he was demanding successfully this prosecution. So the Obama administration pissed away the staggering opportunity to demonstrate the real causes of the great financial crisis and to deter future crises and to bring justice to the system. And yes, Kamala Harris was, I don't know, a B minus, you know, type of thing. Um, there were much better state AGs, Mark being one of them, right? But we, in the con, we talked to a whole series of them. And, and uh, one of June's colleagues 
uh, was a real leader in Minnesota. And you, uh, again, is interviewed in the con. Anyway, we have this enormous asset. And between the administrations and the Supreme Court, we are throwing it away and you can see the results. And the results are terrible in terms of the rule of law. But more broadly, you can see huge swaths of Americans don't believe anything anymore. They just believe we are incapable, that we're all just scum uh, in the government uh, and such. They don't understand how staggeringly useful the Marks and Pauls of the world are and how blessed the country was to have them. And, uh, you know, they were not only not listened to, but they were li not listened to because they were right. Because Paul, they knew they were right. Paul, I, look, <clears throat> you know who I am and I know who you are. OK, but the reason why I had to go on the journey I did to discover the integrity of the law, go figure, right, was because there wasn't ma something making sense in my world. And as a producer and as a guy who could make things happen, I did. And I went out and I talked to the right people. That's what you do in an investigation. That's what Bill taught me. That's what led me to all of you guys. And Mark, I mean, excuse me, Paul, it's not rocket science, it's racketeering. That's what I continue to kind of formulate in my mind, right? Once you get the facts and the evidence, which is the whole system, right, to hold power to account so that we don't go down that road of corruption, like Bastiat said, when a group of men discover plunder, they create a uh, – uh, they, they create a legal code to authorize it and a moral code to glorify it. Look, this is in 1700s imperialist France, right? This is the United States in 2024 with all of the things that you've been through in your career. And Paul, you actually wrote an article that appeared, I think, in the Atlantic that called on creating a Manhattan-like project to handle this financial uh, elite predation in our country. And yet, once again, media has conveyed its ignorance at a mass level of being able to make this front and center to the American people. For example, the New York Times doesn't cover this stuff. The Washington Post doesn't. The Wall Street Journal, are you kidding me? Whatever paper, but we know what's happened to media. I could go on and on and on in my assessment, but but Paul, you've been in the trenches the whole time. What is the Manhattan-like project to, to deal with this, given – the untouchables on this call and people that you know in the system because you were the elite trainer for the Department of Justice. Well, Patrick, uh, you know, we've we've talked about this for a long time now, right? And all of us, I think, agree um, that, but for the way the Obama administration handled the great financial crisis, we might not be in the situation that we're in today. But the, the reality is, we're in this situation that we're in today. And we can have these academic discussions about what we need to do next and what we need to do um, to fix this problem and whether or not the, uh, Kamala Harris will be equipped to do so. But I think it's sort of a false choice. And I think that one of the reasons why I'm on this call today is to 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 at least speak my piece. And that is, look, at, I, I teach corruption, international corruption and money laundering, right? And, and I will tell you that the United States is the leader, as, as Bill Black said, is, is the leader in the world in dealing with these types of problems. Even today, when we all agree we're not handling the, um, uh, um, anything but the, the, what I would say, the routine low-hanging fruit problems. But all of that goes away, in my view, if Donald Trump is elected president. We're, we're, gonna, we're having a discussion that's that is only relevant if you have somebody in charge of this government that is not disassembling the government, which is what he and they want to do. So I, I think we could sit here all day long and, 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 and say how the Democrats um, are, are one of the reasons why we're here. And I think a lot of American people believe that. But <clears throat> to me, it's sort of a false equivalence, a false choice, because um, the guardrails that that held during the first Trump presidency um, have been severely weakened. Um, he knows now who to hire and not hire and who to bring in the administration or not in order to accomplish what I believe the fascist goals that he wants to accomplish. And I think that that all of what we're talking about is 
we won't have these discussions if he's elected. There is no way they're going to have a rational discussion about how to tackle elite financial crime if 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 the Department of Justice is being run by him. So uh, I'm I'm happy to engage you in in sort of uh, uh, this academic exercise about how to fix the problem. But I think that the more uh, uh, the, the the problem that's facing us, hitting us right in the face right now, is why Americans um, um, are, aren't necessarily going to vote for Kamala Harris. And I, I think at the end of the day, that four of us on this call are, are, are the at least the face of the problem. And we're white men. And, and th those those are the people that are going to get Trump elected. And, and, and if we're if this country is saved, it's going to be because of women and women of color. And, and, yeah. and I think and I think uh. there's I think the reason for that is um, um, and I think, Bill, you didn't say who those people that you who stood in your way were, but I bet you they were white guys. And I know and I'm not shitting on all white guys because certainly I'm a white guy. But um, but everybody who said no to me was a white guy. Um, so, uh, um, you know, we, we a, a woman of color being in charge would be a pretty good thing in my in my book. <clears throat> yeah. Can I address yeah. that? <laughs> That's my area. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the new book we have coming out, um, Fair Shake, um, Women's Fight for a Just Economy, is about how women can't win the rigged game. And when we look at uh, what Donald Trump is doing in the political sphere, it's not that different from what he did in the corporate sphere. And it goes like this. First, a power is personalized. It is about asserting dominance. Secondly, make everybody insecure. In the business realm, it's high stakes bonus competitions. In the political realm, he goes around saying we're a shithole country, uh, which we're not. Um, but he, he might make it one. Uh, make everybody insecure. Then pit people against each other. If a black woman becomes president, it's at the expense of some white man who deserves it. And uh, then with come back to the personalized power, I alone can fix it. When we look at the gender differences in the vote, which right now in the US are, are extraordinarily high and particularly high among younger people, uh, they correspond to what is be increasingly a global pattern. Young women internationally are the most liberal group ever polled. Young men are more conservative than their fathers. And when you ask why, you've got to look at how, on a global basis, the middle has been hollowed out of the economy uh, due to automation, uh, due to deunionization, due to globalization. The well-paying jobs that overwhelmingly went to men, um, not exclusively white men, but predominantly white men, uh, are gone. Now what happens? Well, the answer, what I do, and I do labor market analyses of what's happening to women and men, what you see, who's in the middle of the economy? Well, they're school teachers with a wholesale assault on public education. Healthcare is one of the biggest uh, growth factors, but only if the government is, is in the background extending insurance coverage. Um, infrastructure. Uh, but when you look at those kinds of jobs, the female jobs are secure with decent benefits, but not high pay. The male jobs, construction, agriculture, entrepreneurship, even infrastructure are cyclical, not counter cyclical. Many of the men who lost their jobs during the financial crisis never recovered. We have a new group of construction workers. The people who were doing construction and doing well in, say, 2006 never recovered and are angry to this day. Now, you put those pieces together, you hollow out the middle, you destroy unions, you destroy the sense that somebody's there fighting for you. Women are still better off than their mothers. They have more autonomy, but they're angry about uh, the repeal of abortion rights. But men, globally are worse off than their fathers in the industrialized world. And they're angry. And Donald Trump is their champion. And that's political malpractice by Democrats. Um, but they're more willing to tear the whole system down, even if it comes down on their heads. And that's what Trump represents. 
I don't, you know, Kamala to me speaks to women. Kamala invoking the image of the prosecutor is the reinstatement of the rule of law. <laughs> women can't win in a world without police on the beat, <laughs> without streetlights in urban areas, <laughs> without people uh, administering, <laughs> you know, some degree of normality within corporate America. But men have been the losers of this move disproportionately, not exclusively, but in relative terms, men, especially white men, but many Latino and, and black men as well have been losers in this new economy. And there's nobody talking about this as systemic as opposed to we got to fix inflation tomorrow. Well, Mark, I, <laughs> if I could just launch this question to Mark here real quick, because you know, what June identified in what the collective conversation, but particularly off the heels of what uh, Paul just said. Yeah, you know, we got to get elect uh, Kamala and uh, Tim. And by the way, I really like Tim. I, and I appreciate you guys live in Minnesota. But I, I'll tell you, he doesn't seem like if we pressed him that he could lie if he had the information that we're providing him. But to Paul's point, yeah, it's none. Of, it's all out the window. And thank you for saying fascism, Paul. Because what I continue to say is that corruption burrs and fuels fascism. What we're talking about is what's created this madness. And ultimately, the way I look at it, particularly being the producer on the back end of all of the interviews that we've done and all the information and all of the incredible evidence that we had to aggregate to put the case to the American people, which is what you guys collectively do, you know, you, you can't a etch a sketch and just turn the page on this problem that it's joy right we got to get her elected there's no question because we're into fascism that's it it's all the the, the the wheels fell off but the wheels fell off because of the last 40 years of failure of holding corruption to account just like bill has taught us with david k johnson that we could have taken down donald trump decades ago right so here you are mark uh or in in this scenario given everything and yeah we don't want to be academic. We want to be enforcement for a government of, by, and for the people. And the people like Tim Walsh, who served this country as a uh, as a 25-year member of uh, the National Guard, as a guy who's a high school teacher of history, as a guy who um, you know coached his uh, high school team to a state championship. Again, he wasn't baked into one of these private equity firms, right? He wasn't in the revolving door. So what's the message to Kamala in, in the last bit, do we, do we just go hope and change? We can believe in part two, or do we just actually say, look, corruption at the Supreme court, I, I'm just going to say it is an existential threat. The corruption in every direction that made Trump possible is an existential threat. We have the collective ability to reconfigure the rule of law to make fair in an equal opportunity economy happen on behalf of the American people, which the way it is, but you can only address it if you deal with the, the facts and the vision, which is what you had to do. T take us home and then lead us into bill and everybody else. I, I don't know how we could talk all day about this, but there's, there is a solution. So, so yeah. I, and, and again, I didn't, and Paul, I, I appreciate your, your insight. Um, look, um, what I was trying to point to is that, and I think the next in the next 22 days, I don't know how well this could be articulated um, to the to the voters in a way that would be meaningful. But what, but over if, if 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 Senator Harris or, or Vice President Harris was to get elected, uh, I think she could help stop this realignment by embracing the rule of law in the way that we've been talking about today. And I think she certainly has the the tools. And the and and the background to to and the understanding. I, I think she knows the right thing to do. Um, and and my my fear is that she'll be so you know sopped up by the folks that brought her there or who she perceives has brought her there uh, that she'll be she'll, she'll she won't do what what's necessary to do that. So so uh, there is no question. I mean, talk about uh, preemption, Bill. Um, uh, the, you know the the uh, if you think preemption under George W. Bush was was scary. I mean, what, we'll look at it under under Project Twenty Twenty Five. I mean, it's a it's a. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's multiple chapters. I'm afraid to read the thing, but but uh, but I have no doubt that there is because that's you know that's that, it's going to happen and it's going to uh, it's going to uh, disempower Democrats. I, one footnote on Governor Walls, with all due respect, I represent uh, or I've been advising a group of, of retired teachers in Minnesota 
um, who who just want the pension fund there that's directed by the governor and the and the attorney general of all people to to take a closer look at the at the private equity and hedge fund investments that they are invested in to to and to share transparently with the members of that pension fund why you know what what the real performance of those of those investments are and and and, and he and, and Ellison for whatever reasons have been resisting that effort so so you know i mean he's also part of the democratic governors association i mean i, I and i and i so uh and and i i agree with you i mean i i i have the greatest hopes and aspirations for this administration going forward but but they're going to if they can't if they don't if they do win the bigger risk to democracy is not this is not Trump because Trump's going to die and he's crazy, but but it's the guys like JD Vance that are sitting behind him that truly want to deconstruct government for the benefit of the oligarchs um, and know how to do it, um, and 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 so we have one last chance, I believe, in the next four or eight years to 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 uh, rediscover the rule of law to start. Look, I'll, I'll tell you what it will it would. I think it would bring cheer to I, I, the folks on my darts team and the African American men that have peeled away from 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 supporting Harris over over the in the polling over the weekend. I think would cheer uh, watching uh, bank executives go to jail in handcuffs, um, and 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 that and not not and they don't care whether they pay a ten billion dollar fine um, and then go back to their jet to go home um, uh, and go on with their life and business. Um, I, those are the kinds of things if, if that, that could happen. And if there's anything we can do collectively is, is try to help, help them, help the folks that, that if they win, see it. I, I do think there's a good chance that, that, that Harris will win. Um, but, you know, if Trump wins with a, with a Republican Congress, which is, which is a genuine, here we are 22 days before election, and there's a genuine possibility. Um, I mean, you, you, it'll be nothing like we've ever seen. They will disarm uh, the the enforcement uh, mechanisms of the federal government and redirect them towards uh, doing the bidding of a very of of of, of, of a very very small group of elites um, and so um, I, frankly if I had to choose between their elites and our elites I'll take ours um, but that's not a choice that the government the American people ought to have to be making they ought to be making the choice between between a government that's going to stand up for them and a government that is that and and, and that's going to create a level playing field so that they can have aspirations and ultimately meet them uh, economically in, in, in life. So, um, so I think what we're saying is important only, uh, only in the context of that. Um, I mean, there's no question, there's no question of the difference between the two. Um, but I don't think that, uh, and, and, and that's why I was, you know, when we started talking about doing this conversation um, right after the convention, you know, there was still a chance that that, that, that populism, economic populism could have been, uh, incorporated into some of the messaging um, that went on, and because it wouldn't have dawned on Tony West, um, uh, uh, Pres uh, Vice President Harris's brother-in-law, who was the lo corporate lobbyist for Uber, um, uh, or, or or the other folks that are surrounding her from the Obama administration, it would just wouldn't dawn on them that that would be a resonant argument to make, um, uh, and it would also certainly get them disinvited to some of the better cocktail parties. And, and so we don't want that, you know, we, we, we need to not be those folks anymore, uh, or we are going to, if it's not this round, we are going to empower fascism in this country um, because, uh, because there's a lot of very intelligent, caring people who love their kids and pet their dogs who think that it would be, we would be better off with, 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 with Trump making all the rules uh, than we are with, with a democratic society. Uh, Bill, I'm going to toss this to you, but with uh, a little bit of a ramp up here, and then I want to ask, encourage you to all maybe have some closing comments after Bill. Um, but uh, the reason I wanted to do this is because I'm trying to force truth through this ocean of madness and lies that we've been in the midst of for not the last six months, not the last several years, but for decades. And Bill, Everything that I've learned from you and everything that I've seen demonstrated is just such an upside down, perverse, inverse, unfortunately, in a control fraud like caricature of this whole uh, political juggernaut that's going to create fascism if we don't serve, you know, uh, if we don't save democracy. But what democracy is it? Right. It's got to be a democracy in the sort of spirit of what you all have done in your entire careers, but also what we learned from Ferdinand Pecora following the uh, the Great Depression. But Bill, look, 
the United States government, and, and, and to, to Paul's point, that it has been people of color who have risen to the moment to bring the indictments of Donald Trump, whether it's Alvin Bragg, whether it's Letitia James, whether it's, you know, Fonnie Willis with all of the problems that are involved with that. But, you know, in, in, in whomever else might be involved with these, you know, scenarios. But the, 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 the sum total of Donald Trump and these 91 indictments has been defrauding the United States through deceptive acts and practices, through the Electoral College using uh, forgeries and the elector scheme to steal the Electoral College, in addition to the falsification of business records, the falsification of uh, you know, that all play into the, you know, defrauding uh, what led to the 34 criminal convictions that, you know, is just throw out the baby with the bathwater. Like, I mean, we've got a we've got a literal convicted uh, felon. And yet here's the prosecutor, Kamala. And, and what the issues are is supposedly the opportunity economy. Supposedly, you know, we're going to incentivize building houses based on giving people $25,000 to throw down as a, pay a payment. Like we don't know what that, that could potentially do to hyperinflating prices based on appraisal fraud and so on and so forth. The country just doesn't understand what's going on. They don't understand who's in power. They don't understand how they control the situation through all of these different varieties. This is a, you guys have the collective answers. Please, Bill, take me to a place that we can have hope even though it's not necessary to hope. And I don't want hope and change. I want real supermen right now to use the law to take down the corruption that has perverted this country into this juggernaut that we're in the midst of. So I'll pick up on what uh, Paul uh, was saying in particular um, and uh, endorse it. Uh, it turns out the Republicans, you know, the old school when there were actual Republicans, before Trumpers were right about one thing, and that is America is the essential nation. And it is uh, remarkably exemplary historically compared to other nations. Other nations, if you go, if you travel abroad, they look to the United States and they look even when they're mocking us. So, when we in the United States adopted first of any nation, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which is against commercial bribery, the rest of the world mocked us. Corrupt CEOs applauded it, you know, and said, this is great. We'll be able to take over business by bribing people and all these things. And we even get to openly declare it as a business expense in Germany back then, right? You could openly say, I'm deducting this from my taxes because I bribed. I spent, you know, 12 million Deutsche Mark bribing a Congolese official. And th this is just the stupidest thing they'd ever seen in the world, trying to uh, stop corruption and it was just, they were just going to eat our lunch. Well, it turns out now to be an OECD, which is the big economy nation, you must have your a version, a strong version of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The United States created that, right? Just as we created actual antitrust prosecutions, which are vanishingly rare in the rest of the world. And yeah, there's been stuff that has uh, gutted much of antitrust enforcement in the U.S., but the hardcore cartels, as they're called, that we still um, tend to actually send people to prison. That pretty much happens only in the United States of America. Because you know what it turns out? It turns out being ethical, more ethical. <laughs> Lots of unethical things go on in America, obviously, but striving for that, striving to create a rule of law where it isn't just a mouthpiece, where the Mark Dan's in Ohio will work with local 
cops to do an elite white collar crime investigation and a successful prosecution. This doesn't happen in the rest of the world. You don't have people like us blowing the whistle on five U.S. senators in many places in the world. We'd be dead. We'd be found in a ditch without our heads, right, in most of the world. The United States has this great stuff, and it's great for consumers. It's great for honest CEOs, because honest CEOs in many parts of the world, they're just put out of business, right? This is a really good thing. The folks you see along those top lines, they made life vastly better, not just for us, the public, but for honest business people. This is what a Gresham's dynamic Preventing a Gresham's dynamic is all about, in which if you gain a competitive advantage by cheating, then bad ethics drives good ethics out of the marketplace. Honest business people can't survive. We have vast imperfections. Mark has been emphasizing those. June and I can tell you, and, you know, all of us can you know, tell you at extraordinary length, but we need to also not forget that we have a system worth fighting for and saving this rule of law. This is an existential election. There is only one choice. If you believe in democracy, if you believe in the rule of law, if you believe in honest business people prevailing. Now, after we save the nation, we have all kinds of policy issues and what the best way to improve it. But we have a month to save the nation, actually less than a month to save the nation. That's what we're up to. Any final and to comments? save much of the world. Any final comments from anybody else? Or are you guys exhausted from the, the concept? We know we have to save America. It's not let, me, let me just say that I um, probably shouldn't be, but I, Mark and like June and like Bill, I, I remain hopeful too that should Kamala get elected, and I pray that she does, that she'll see how important it is to prosecute these these fraudsters, these criminals, these corrupt, these corrupt people, these elite white collar frauds. I, I really remain hopeful. And I, and I believe that, or I hope that Walls, who is not polluted yet by Washington, might have a perspective that's a little bit different. Um, and, um, but, uh, you, you know, I, I say you only need a couple examples to show what, whether we would even be here if we had just done our job back during the great financial crisis. And I'll, I'll point to two examples. One, Morvillo, right? So the, the, he was let off the hook, told they weren't going to prosecute him, probably one of the biggest uh, uh, fraudsters of the day, let off the hook, told by the Central District of California that they were not, they were going to decline prosecution after the SEC held him liable in a scathing um, factual uh, resume. So think of, uh, of Mark's Friends playing darts. If if he had been hauled off in handcuffs, think of how they feel. Think about how how the men in uh, the white men in Western Pennsylvania would feel if the if a few of those people had just been arrested and held accountable, right? And then and 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 part of it is exactly what Bill said. The Obama administration didn't train these people. Didn't 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 force these prosecutors in California to do their job, right? And then the final example I leave you with that that would be a, a one we wouldn't be here today if someone had just if if the, those prosecutors in California had done their job. Well, I think everybody remembers Trump University, right? That was a crime all over the place. Can you imagine if he had been prosecuted? I mean, we wouldn't be here today, and we prosecute those types of crimes all the time. So the the legacy of 
people not doing their J-O-B in this arena continues to haunt us. And I just hope that, 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 that people in power see that because it's so obvious. Well, and it'd be nice in the next 22 days if, 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 if the, uh, somebody at the higher levels of this campaign could articulate that message. Oh, because they talk a lot about saving the rule of law and about saving democracy, but they don't talk about how they're going to do it. Um, they're not talking about that at all. Um, and if there's any anything we can, <laughs> if any of this seep, seeps to somebody that 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 has some control over that discussion and and what what the, what message they put out uh, going forward, it's not just because we like laws. We want to save the rule of law because it means that 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 you're going to be able to buy things for fair prices. It means that you're going to be able to. Um, that you're gonna that you, that people who cheat will be held accountable. That ethical businesses will be rewarded for their for their for their high ethics and in 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 going forward. Um, and and I, so they need to put more meat on that on that argument um, in order for it to have the resonance with the people that I think at this point that are left to reach in this world um, who 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 don't who might be on the fence about whether or not Trump. I, I love this. They don't think he means what he says. Um, that, that was in the New York Times today. There are lots of people in the poll are, are for Trump because they don't really think and they think we just we're just we're just, you know, uh, chicken littles over here uh, running around, you know, with our head cut off. Um, and, and it's not that's not that's not us. But but and there's a great way to articulate that. Here's what we're going to here's why we're going to stop that. Here's what the rule of law means to you guys at um, at Masters Bar on the Darts team. And, and how we're going to make it work for you going forward. Can I just yeah. add so, one thing can... to, to what uh, um, Paul just explained? It isn't simply the Justice Department didn't stop the U.S. attorney in the Central District of California from doing bad things. They He's the guy I was quoting. He's <laughs> the guy they put in charge of training. So I, I would like to invoke a long tradition of prosecutors running for office on the basis of taking on the power. And we need a villain. Donald Trump's villain, well, I won't speak for you, but I will say it's me, insufferable academics, especially feminists. But um, what we need is a villain and prosecutors taking on those villains. So let me just flag a few recent missed opportunities. Ohio, the trans derailment. Pete mm -hmm. Buttigieg, uh, he should have been there talking about who's really to blame, which includes right. Trump, by the way. Uh, yes. Florida, <laughs> I mean, there ought to be a message out there. Who is it who's responsible for this? Hey, if Democrats control the weather, they would have directed the hurricane at Mar-a-Lago. Um, but there are a whole lot of people out there lying to you, including insurance companies who are no longer going to insure you. When did insurance companies know this is going to happen? A whole long time ago. When did, uh, why is it nobody's doing anything about it? Because ExxonMobil has gone all the way to the bank. But we don't have people picking fights with the power in a way that convinces uh, those folks who know the system is corrupt that there's anybody who will do anything about it. Well, I'm going to close it uh, this way. Look, guys, I'm, what you're looking at is the powerhouse of the best that America has produced on behalf of the law for the American people that have demonstrated for decades their understanding and their ability to take on the most powerful institutions in this country on behalf of the American people. The point is it exists. And here's the thing that uh, Bill used to say to me all the time when we were putting together uh, our work, The Con, that you can find at www.thecon.tv, which is a blueprint for all of this. And nobody ever did it. We did it. OK, it should be seen by tens of millions of people. And the reason it hasn't been is because the system doesn't want it seen. And I could go off on that for a, for a long time because I've learned some information that's pretty, pretty stunning. But the, the, this is child's play. The stuff that Bill did 
in the savings and loan crisis is infinitely more sophisticated than what we're talking about with a guy who is not an elite um, uh, a predator. Donald Trump is a buffoon again. The system failed to take him down decades ago. And like I said at the beginning of this thing, we've demonstrated that P. Diddy for all the insanity that's happening there and Weinstein. When the law works, it can take down powerful people uh, for their indiscretions properly because, you know, if you don't take out the bad guys and what we learned in the making of the con because of what Mark Dan showed us, that when you when you don't apply the law, the criminals take over. That's all this has been. And, 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 and the ship's going down unless and, – and, 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 and I'll finish with this. This is the hardest thing for me to stomach because of what everybody has said to me and on this call today. But former Attorney General Eric Holder, who was you know the Attorney General during the Obama administration, who decided not to bring what Bill had described as probably the easily the – most, the most easy to prevent climb, or, uh, economic crisis – that this country's ever faced, to not bring down the convictions to the CEOs that were responsible for this just created the last 14 years of what's led to now. It's enough, people. We have the information. The, the, the people that you're seeing on this screen in front of you, I encourage you to look into them, reach out to me, reach out to all of us, but the power brokers that I'm going to introduce this to, specifically journalists, you have to understand we have answers. We have the ability. We have the know-how. We have um, uh, the techniques that we all fantasize in television stories of the good guys going after the bad guys and taking them down. We've had cartoon characters our entire life. I could go on and on and on. People, uh, my friends, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you make me so proud that I've had the opportunity to get to know you. I'm going to do everything in my power to penetrate every every aspect of this power structure to get this information to the people, to create the critical mass, to force the power to finally open this up because there's no time to lose. But to reiterate what Paul said and what everybody said on this on this call, if Donald Trump wins, lights out. And I'm sure that, um, you know, he's got a plan with all of his billionaire buddies right now to figure out a way to, um, you know, basically create uh, the insurrection part two. So whatever's on the horizon, it's up to us to we the people uh, and, and I and I should finish the thought about Eric Holder. Eric Holder, giving everything he said six months ago, said to us, the American people, it's up to us to solve this riddle because they didn't. Anyway, it's very frustrating, but I know we can pull this off. Thank you guys for joining me. We'll try everything we can to make this a better uh, America. All the best. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you.